Hi Grace Vineyard, it's Andy here. I've entitled today's talk, Are You Listening? Are you listening to God? And are you making sure that people feel that you're listening to them? I'm uncomfortable about making this video, it's all new to me. Some of you know that I hate techie stuff and we're having to rely on that. I hate recordings of myself, but I've got to pass on to you the message that God's been telling me so I've just got to get on with this and stop whinging about it. I've had some help from Oliver and, uh, and obviously Mark, so thank you. I still don't like Zoom, I don't like mobile phones, but I'm forced to use them to keep in contact with you. In my last talk, I said that we're all in isolated leaky boats. We're battling against the storm of the COVID-19 pandemic. We're still in that storm, of course, the storm's dying down, but we're still wondering what's around the corner. The storm is still isolating us, and the longer the storm continues, we can easily lose sight of each other. We can easily misjudge what's going on in each other's lives while we tackle our own storm. The longer this storm lasts, we're going to face more and more mental issues, mental health issues, if we're honest. They reckon that about one in five of us are depressed at the moment. If you're not depressed, I bet that you're frustrated about something or other. The communication that we do have with each other has got its limits and it can easily lead us into misunderstanding. Words on their own can be ambiguous and confusing. We're not able to communicate properly yet. We must be very careful and considerate because we're all tense much of our lives are still on hold. Boundaries can quickly change and we can get so easily frustrated with things that we can't do that were so easy before. We've got to muddle on and use what we have and not mope about what we've lost. In many ways, we've got to take each day at a time. Jesus told us to do that anyway, so be patient. You may think that others know how things are with you. We probably don't. Sometimes I'm upstairs and Sue carries on with the conversation that we've been having downstairs. All I can hear is a <laughs> She could say to me, but I told you, but I didn't hear a word of it. She has to repeat it so that I can hear it. When you tell something to someone, something that's important especially, please make sure that it's not lost in a muddle of all sorts of other things you say. Please be clear. We all live in a busy, complicated world. Don't presume and don't expect people to notice. We're all busy and confused and frustrated. Please communicate and don't suffer alone. God gave you the church for community, but you'll probably have to make the first move if you need help. We're all battling our own different storms, but we should be there for each other, so please ask. We've just had an interlude from the Book of Acts with some talks based on the Sermon on the Mount. Mark Fizer started with telling us about how we must be salt and light in the world. Then Joe challenged us about who we're trying to impress. Lastly, Mark Stoneham was encouraging us to put Jesus' words into practice, to live by them. And I want to build on all three of these talks. The message that God's given me for you this week is about listening and acting on prompts from the Holy Spirit. We've looked at how God helped the early church. Our story continues with this bit about Peter and how the gospel was taken to the first Gentile, non-Jewish believers. It's a long story. I won't read out all of it because it has some repeating as Cornelius and then Peter retell their side of the story. So I'll read most of Acts 10 and a little bit of chapter 11 from the message version. It's often refreshing to hear things differently using different words than what we're used to. This is Acts 10. There was a man named Cornelius who lived in Caesarea, captain of the Italian guard stationed there. He was a thoroughly good man. He'd led everyone in his house to live worshipfully before God. He was always helping people in need and he had the habit of prayer. One day, 
about three o'clock in the afternoon, he had a vision. An angel of God, as real as his next door neighbour, came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared hard, wondering if he was seeing things. And then he said, what do you want, sir? The angel said, your prayers and your neighbourly acts have brought you to God's attention. Here's what you're to do. Send men to Joppa to get Simon, the one that everyone calls Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is down by the sea. <coughs> Excuse me. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two servants and one particularly devout servant of the guard. He went over with them in great detail about what had just happened and he sent them off to Joppa. So the next day, as the three travellers were approaching the town, Peter went out on the balcony to pray. It was about noon. Peter got hungry and he started thinking about lunch. And while lunch was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the skies open up. Something that looked like a huge blanket lowered by ropes on its four corners it settled on the ground. Every kind of animal, reptile and bird you could think of was on it. Then a voice said, go to it, Peter, kill and eat. Peter said, no, Lord, I've never so much as tasted food that wasn't kosher. A voice came a second time. If God says it's OK, it's OK. This happened three times and then the blanket was pulled up into the skies. As Peter puzzled, sat there trying to figure out what it all meant, the men came from Cornelius, showed up at Simon's front door. They called in, asked if there was a Simon, also called Peter, staying there. Peter, lost in thought, didn't hear them, so the spirit whispered to him, three men are knocking at the door looking for you. Get down, go there, get, get down there and go with them. Don't ask them questions, I've sent them to get you. Peter went down and said to them, I think that I'm the man you're looking for, what's up? So they said, Captain Cornelius, a God-fearing man, well known for his fair play, ask any Jew in this part of the country, was commanded by a holy angel to get you and to bring you to his house so that he could hear what you had to say. So Peter invited them in and made them feel at home. The next morning he got up and he went with them. Some of his friends from Joppa went along. A day later they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and he had his relatives and close friends waiting with them. The minute Peter came through the door, Cornelius was up on his feet greeting him and then down on his face worshipping him. But Peter pulled him up and said, none of that, I'm only a man, I'm a man, no different from you. Talking things over, they went on into the house, where Cornelius introduced Peter to everyone who'd come. Peter addressed them. You know, I'm sure that this is highly irregular. Jews just don't do this. Visit and relax with people from another race. But God has shown me that no race is better than any other. So the minute I, sent, I was sent for, I came, no questions asked. But now I'd like to know why you have sent me. So Peter now listens to Cornelius as he retells his story again about the angel giving him instructions to, to go and find Peter. Cornelius continues, so I did it, I sent for you and you've been good enough to come, but now we're here in God's presence, ready to listen to whatever the master has put in your heart to tell us. Peter fairly exploded with his good news. It's God's own truth, nothing could be plainer. God plays no favourites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do as he says, the doors open. The message he sent to his children of Israel, that through Jesus Christ, everything is being put together again. Well, he's doing it everywhere and among everyone. You know the story of what happened in Judea. It began in Galilee after John preached a total life change. Then Jesus arrived from Nazareth, anointed by God with the Holy Spirit, ready for action. He went through the country helping people 
and healing everyone who was beaten down by the devil. He was able to do this because God was with him. And we saw it, saw it all. Everything he did in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem where they killed him, hung him on the cross. But in three days God had him up alive and out where he could be seen. Not everyone saw him. He, was put, he wasn't put on public display. Witnesses had been carefully handpicked by God beforehand, us. We're the ones there to eat and drink with him after he came back from the dead. He commissioned us to announce this in public, to bear solemn witness that he in fact is the one who God destined to ju as judge of the living and the dead. But we're not in this alone. Our witness is that the, the, our, our witness that he is the means to forgiveness of sins is backed up by the witness of all the prophets. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. No sooner were these words out of Peter's mouth than the Holy Spirit came on his listeners. The believing Jews who'd come with Peter couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the outside of non-Jews. But there it was. They heard them speaking in tongues heard them praising God. Then Peter said, do I hear any objections to baptising these friends with water? They've received the Holy Spirit exactly as we did. Hearing no objections, he ordered that they be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay on for a few days. The news travelled fast and in no time the leaders and friends back in Jerusalem heard about it. They heard that the non-Jewish outsiders were now in. When Peter got back to Jerusalem, some of his old associates who were concerned about circumcision called him on the carpet. What do you think you're doing rubbing shoulders with that crowd, eating what's prohibited and ruining our good name? So Peter, starting from the beginning, laid it out for them step by step. So Peter tells the church leaders how God had guided him and Cornelius together. So Peter carries on. So I started in talking. Before I'd spoken half a dozen sentences, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as he did on, on us the first time. I remember Jesus' words, John baptised with water, but you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. So I ask you, if God gave the same exact gift to them as to us when we believed in the Master Jesus Christ, how could I object to God? Hearing it all laid out like that, they quietened down. And then, as it sunk in, they started praising God. It's really happened. God has broken through to other nations, opened them up to life. So this was an extremely important moment for the church. It grows from being an exclusively Jewish group to one that includes Gentiles like you and me. There were small divisions over this issue, but it could have created a huge problem for the early church. Because Peter and the early church leaders listened and followed God rather than tradition, it went as smoothly as possible. Galatians 3.28, hopefully you'll see that below me explains how there should be no divisions in the church that God builds. We're supposed to be united. If we listen to God and not our own selfish agendas, then we will be united. But in today's story, we've got guys who've got, who have visits from angels or visions from God to guide them into this very important landmark for the church history. It's why we're here together today Maybe we're not in the same building, but none of us, as far as I know, are Jews, but we're all believers. We're followers of Jesus. Have you ever seen an angel? I'm pretty sure that I never have. I'm, I've certainly never seen a guy dressed in, in white, in a big white dress and huge wings. I think I might have noticed that and remember it. I do know a lady that did get a glimpse of an angel once, and that wasn't while she was on drugs. Have you ever had a vision? I've never physically seen things with my eyes, but I get ideas or things like messages which flash into my brain from nowhere. There four, there's four and a half years between my two grown up children. We struggled to conceive my son, but one evening while we were praying 
for Sue to conceive, I had the phrase, his name is Samuel, flash into my thoughts from nowhere. So when Sue conceived that month, we couldn't really call him anything different. I've been open about my struggle with self-confidence and that I'm really a shy guy who God is transforming. I'm gaining confidence as I submit to the work of the Holy Spirit within me. I've had what some people call pictures when unusual things spring into my mind from nowhere while I seek God. I was once praying for a lady and the Cheshire cat from Alice in Wonderland came into my mind. It was absolute nonsense to me, but the lady called her daughter's teacher the Cheshire cat because this lady grinned a lot. Because I mentioned this, it gave her peace that her daughter was in good hands. If you want, in her own spare time, I'll give you stories about other stupid things that flashed into my brain. The trick is to be bold, take the risk to share it. The worst situation is that people will think that you're weird. I gave up on that one years ago. You all know that I'm weird. I'm a jokey sort of person and I try not to take myself too seriously. I'm learning not to worry or care about what others think about me. God can use my sense of humour if I harness it well. We're all different. Learn from me, but don't try and be me. I can't be a Johnny Rose. He can write sermons in a couple of hours. My way is slow and methodical. I've had to re read, reread and refine. That's how I work well. And it's all God wants from me to be like Jesus in an Andy Belsey sort of way. This sermon has taken hours and hours and hours. Trying to be like Jesus is a waste of effort, even more than trying to be Mark Visser. Someone else has got that job. My job is to, what, is to use what God has entrusted me with. I learn from others, but I have to learn by practice and prayerful experiment how it works for me. I ask the Holy Spirit to guide me every day. I learn from mistakes and doing things well. When I wake up, I ask for God's help daily. I often pray when I walk out the front door or go somewhere for God to send people to me, people who need reminded of his love, need to be reminded about his love. Sometimes, if I'm honest, I'm disappointed about the people that, that he sends to me, but I'm learning to ruthlessly eliminate hurry. Do you remember hearing that before? ruthlessly eliminate hurry. My aim is that when people have an encounter with me that they get a hint of Jesus and they leave the meeting with me feeling happier and not just relieved that I've gone. I try not to rush away from conversations. This is easier for me while I'm on furlough. Sue keeps telling me it's all right for you. If I don't do this today I've got to work tomorrow. But Jesus is my example to follow and never get rushed to do something or to go somewhere. Jairus's daughter and Lazarus both died while Jesus waited. He still sorted those problems out later on, but he didn't rush. Love takes time. The roads and the internet would be much kinder places if we weren't in such a hurry. Slow down. An important lesson that I'm trying to learn is to listen. I try to listen to God and what he wants me to say to someone, but I'm also trying to listen to people. God gave us two ears and one mouth. Shut up and listen. Very often, people don't want your advice. They don't want, all they want is to be heard. Speaking out or sharing how we feel can be therapy, just just on its own. Before Peter spoke to Cornelius and his friends, did you notice that he asked them, but now I'd like to know why you have sent for me. As I read the Pete Scazzaro's book, Emotionally Healthy Spiritually, sorry, say that again, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. There was a story in that about a, a guy who came away from a conversation he realised that the whole of the time that they were talking, he'd been thinking about the next thing he would say. 
He just wanted to add his stories to better what the other guy was saying. Sadly, he'd hardly heard a thing that the other guy was saying because his mind was so full of what he was itching to say and impress the other guy with. Please listen to people. I've been linking this to the teaching about ruthlessly eliminating hurry. Jesus never rushed people. The only people who left him angry were the proud, arrogant ones. People who wasn't, wouldn't listen to his warnings anyway. I've said that I've been time rich during furlough. While others have rushed off their feet, the government, bless them, have paid me to do DIY, finishing, if, finishing off my book, doing paintings and blessing my neighbourhood. At the beginning of lockdown, I set up a support network, mainly by email, so that my neighbours could help, encourage and support each other. We had links in the neighbourhood already, but this has enabled us to pass on important messages to each other, things that are happening on our doorsteps. Although I've tried to get the others to post to the rest, they always look to me as its founder. We've had a birth and a death locally, but we've been communicating. We've been helping to beat the isolation, creating community. The neighbours all know that Sue and I are Christians. It's something we've always been very upfront about, but it's not shoved in their faces. If they had any thought that they're just targets for us to evangelise to, then they'd run a mile. You can watch some people's faces glaze over as you get onto the subject of what they call religion. I try to be kind and I try to give people time. I earn the right to listen to personal things that they share with me and it would be very wrong for me to share their private business with you. That is just rude gossip. So I'm not going to tell you stories. When I talk to my neighbours, my work colleagues or my family, I try to look for common ground, things that we're both interested in. I try to stop myself relating all the thoughts that naturally buzz into my head, thoughts which could really surprise or impress them. Of course, that sort of junk does come out of my mouth. I'm still learning. We were talking with friends the other day and near the time of leaving, we were told about a medical issue that they were facing and we did pray together before we left. But afterwards, Sue said to me, did you realise that I almost shared that earlier on, but you started talking about your own health stories? Whoops, my big mouth nearly spoilt it. My fragile ego got in the way and could have stopped them sharing this deep issue, which was obviously on their minds. Hold your breath and give people time and space. Did you hear that? Hold your breath, give people time and space to share. Obviously, you'll need discernment because some people are like insatiable sponges. They'll waste your time if you let them. But there are ways of being gently firm to give someone a few minutes to be heard and loved. But then you must apologise and let them understand that you have to stop the conversation. The most important thing is that they leave, leave the conversation happy that you've showed them love but you might have to be firm. Some of you will remember Richard, who used to be here at Grace Vineyard. Something that he said many times, so I remember it, is build bridges for Jesus to walk over. He'd heard it at the annual leaders conference. Think about it, build bridges for Jesus to walk over. You're unlikely to talk to somebody about Jesus for the first time and then lead them to faith in the same conversation. They'll gradually learn to trust you and to listen. And as you listen to them, as you care for them, and as you feel what they th that you think that what they're saying is what they're saying is important, and that they're important. There's another book that I've read by a vineyard guy called Jay Pathak. It's called The Art of Neighbouring. I heard him speak and I found him very inspiring. I try to follow the principles of his book. I listen, I care and I ask questions. When I next see the person who's shared something with me, I ask them how the situation is now. If you've put yourself in their shoes and tried to understand their feelings and tried to remember their hurts and their fears, then people would know that they're important to you. 
They'll spot if you're just trying to sell them something or just a target for you to regurgitate your problems or boast about what you've got. Some people are about as welcome as a fart in a lift. People will try to escape as quickly as they can, gagging for air. Don't be like that. Sorry about my crude humour, but it makes a point. Listen, care and inquire. Don't use and abuse people. Jay Pathak tells you that tell, says that he tells stories. People can't deny something which you've experienced. They may tell you that your conclusions are wrong, but they can't say it never happened. Another important pointer is to tell people about Jesus. Church history and the church today is a catalogue of errors. The church does awful things, does things in the name of Jesus, which he would deny. The church is very often something not to celebrate, but we can talk about Jesus with confidence. He didn't make mistakes because he was guided by his father and he's the example to point people to. Talk about Jesus and tell them your Jesus stories, but also listen, remember and ask when you're back together again. This is how you build up trust and as you speak into people's lives. You've heard the phrase, maybe, preach the gospel and occasionally use words. Your life and how you treat people bears much more weight than what you say. People will smell a hypocrite a mile off. People should have an encounter with you feeling loved. They will if you partner with the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. People should leave an encounter with you feeling loved. I'm slowly learning how to hear God. Sometimes God turns up in very unexpected ways. Peter had tried to be a good Jew by what he ate, but God used that to make him do something new. If you get a voice in your head saying, go and steal that car or sleep with that woman, these are things that are obviously not messages from the Father. If you've read your Bible, especially how Jesus lived and what he said, then you'll know. The more you understand the Bible, the clearer the inner, wasp inner whisper from God will get in your head. I ask God to lead me and speak to me. I try to text or email or speak to people when I think of them and the situations that they've shared with me. I often make notes to help as prompts. I ask God to bring people to me and I pray for the patients to listen, to stand in their shoes and to understand them. I try to be kind and gentle because that's how God has made me. I then try to gently and lovingly share my relationship with God with them in a way that makes it attractive. You'll have to learn your own ways of partnering with the Holy Spirit using the personality that God has entrusted with you. I want to relate a short illustration now, something that God has revealed to me over the years. It was originally someone else's idea and I've had helps from others, but this story came to me in its fullness uh, in the intense time that I had God earlier this year. I understood it more and I wrote it down. I guess this is what you call spirit guided writing. I've called it spiritual surfing. Moving in God's Holy Spirit is similar to surfing in that both are guided by the wind. The wind of the Holy Spirit moves the, the sea of circumstances to create waves which can carry you. In Jewish culture, the sea represented evil because the sea is chaotic and unpredictable. On your surfboard, you ride above the circumstances as the spirit creates the wave that you follow. There are many three in one formulas in the, in the world that God's created. And in this illustration, there's another trinity, things that work best together in harmony, the wave, the surfer and the surfboard. There's a skill in spotting the coming wave to catch it as it passes. Each surf will be determined by how you follow the wave. The board 
represents the talents that God's entrusted you with. We've all got different talents and surfers use boards which vary in colour and shape. Use the board that God has given you and not, don't envy those who've got something different. You have to swim out into the sea to find where to catch the best waves. You swim by prayer, by Bible reading and by daily rhythm. By that I mean something which connects you with God. You have to seek God to show you where you can pick up the wave. Because the sea represents circumstances, it can be very difficult for you to get where you want. The sea is very rough at times, it can overwhelm you, but you must battle on using prayer, Bible reading and daily rhythm. Once you've caught a wave, it can take you as far as the beach if you follow it well. There's a joyful freedom as you ride the wave and a satisfaction as you partner with the Holy Spirit, especially when you reach the beach. But now you've got an important choice. You can stay on your board pretending to surf, which looks a bit like surfing, but it isn't because it lacks the power of the Spirit on the waves. Where the waves break is a dangerous place to stay because the waves constantly break over you. You're reminded of the power of the sea and you'll soon get scared and discouraged. On the beach, you must rest with God in Sabbath to regain strength and plan further surfs. Sometimes you'll need a secluded beach hut where you can get alone with the Lord without distraction. But on the beach, you'll find your church family. You can be joined by fellow surfers to share tips, to plan and to encourage each other with the experiences that you've gained from previous surfs. Your fellow surfers can watch you and tell you what you're doing well or what could improve. You can't surf for others, but you can surf alongside each other, guiding where to go. The knowledge and skill for surfing is accumulated and honed by experience, and you can't expect to be an expert expert surfer straight away. There's a skill in knowing where and when God is sending you. Regular rest is very important because trying to constantly surf will only burn you out. So work from a place of rest. Expert surfers are those who know the way of the Spirit well from experience, spotting how the Spirit is affecting the circumstances. The most skillful surfer of all, of course, was Jesus. He was able to do it without the aid of a surfboard. Hopefully that helps you. So in conclusion, are you listening to the gentle whisper of the Holy Spirit? While you battle on with your own private Covid storm, can I encourage you to look beyond the end of your nose, look out for other people. When God puts someone on your mind, please try and contact them somehow. We're made for community. We're supposed to care about each other. Jesus said, this is John 13, love each other just as much as I have loved you. Your strong love for each other will prove to the world that you're my disciples. So please listen to God. Please do what he tells you to do. Let's beat the fear and the frustration of COVID-19 together as God planned us to do. God is much bigger than this storm. Show the world the hope and the love that we live in. Thank you.